Welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is Mark Erickson. Mark is a family law attorney, and his firm is located in Campbell, California. He graduated with a JD, or a law degree, from Santa Clara University School of Law in 1979. He was admitted to the California State Bar and U.S. District Court, Northern District of California in 1979. After working for another attorney, mostly in the area of civil and business litigation from 1979 to 1984, he started his own law firm in 1985 and became a certified law specialist by the Board of Legal Specialization of the State Bar of California in 1987. Time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Yeah. He's lectured and presented seminars for many groups, including as a teaching assistant and guest lecturer at Santa Clara University School of Law. And in his other life, Mark plays amateur ice hockey, and he has two adult sons? Two adult sons, yes. Right. And one of his sons is following Mark's footsteps as a lawyer. How's that going? It's going well so uh, far. Oh, good, good, good news. Anyway, uh, I have some interviews that I've done before with Mark. Uh, we talked about spousal support and child custody, and those are posted under past episodes at our website, which is financialinsiderweekly.com. And we are going to uh, do another little series this year. Uh, so we're going to talk about basics today uh, related to divorce. I call it Divorce California Style. Uh, and then we're also going to do uh, some additional interviews on residence and family business issues for a divorce. So. Um, Mark always does a great job. I'm so pleased to have you as a guest again. Thanks for coming, Mark. Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay. Uh, well, I guess one thing before, I mean, this is just an introduction, folks. I mean, Mark did a lot of studying to get that certification. Uh, and he and I have been talking about, you know, a lot of the different issues related to divorce, to divorce in California. Uh, the rules vary a little bit from state to state, so I think I'll mention that too up front. Uh, but, you know, at least it'll give you some basic ideas for a conversation then uh, that you should be having uh, with your own attorney. And another thing uh, I'm hoping is, is that by the time we get done with you folks, maybe you'll be thinking again about whether you should be going ahead with this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mark, how does this whole divorce process get started? Well, the uh, legal process is very easy to start. It starts out with the filing of a petition, normally a petition for dissolution of marriage. It's a pre-printed form, uh, front mm -hmm. and back, uh, so you fill out essentially two pages, and uh, there isn't too much more information other than your name, uh, your spouse's name, children's names, dates of birth, and uh, the date of marriage and the alleged date of separation. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Uh, that and in Santa Clara County, a $435 filing fee uh, gets the process started. Okay. Gee, it doesn't seem like such a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the easy part. Yeah, then you get into the details, right? <laughs> yeah. Although it isn't always easy for people to make that initial decision to start the process. Right. So, well, what's the right time to file for a divorce? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, I guess there's a few parts to that question. I, I always tell people the right time to start is probably when you've decided that your marriage truly is over and you've exhausted efforts at reconciliation and, and you really decide that there's a, a final and complete break in your marriage and it really is over. Um, the timing can have uh, consequences, though. Um, we're often concerned about the date of separation. As you know, California is a community property state. Mm -hmm. And so the time you separate can make a difference in terms of property division, debt responsibility, and other rights and responsibilities. Um, so that, that physical separation, when you actually move out and are separate and apart, can determine, um, for example, uh, when your income from your employment becomes your separate property, which is yours alone, as opposed to community property that's divided equally. And this, this comes up um, uh, and makes it can be a big part of the decision process uh, when it comes to division of stock options, 
401k plans and bonuses, uh, and of course uh, debt allocation, a debt incurred shortly before separation is divided equally, mm -hmm. even though one spouse may have used it for their own purposes, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a debt incurred after separation is assigned uh, to the spouse who incurs that debt. Yeah. It's oversimplification, but those are the general concepts. Okay. Um, so are there differences between men and women as far as how they approach this and, and when they make this decision to go ahead and... I, I've do, done this for about almost 33 years now and I would say that what I see, at least at the initial consultation stage, is there, there seems to be a little bit of a difference, at least in, as far as once uh, somebody comes in to see me for the first time. In the case of men, I find that they usually are not ready to file, that they're looking for information, and they tend to come back multiple times before they're ready to make a decision, or they come back after they've actually been served and their wife has started the process. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get around to it. Why heck, I will. Uh, that does happen. <laughs> I, I, in my experience, I'd say generally, this is a, an overgeneralization, that women seem to be a little more decisive once they've made a decision that their marriage is over. They seem to be more willing to actually initiate the process. And I don't have any statistics for you, but it certainly seems to me that more often than not, women are the petitioners, or maybe that's going to change over time. Well, that's kind of interesting. Well, I think it comes back to that theory, you know, uh, I think it's the Mars and Venus deal, you know, John Gray or whatever, and he talks about men being in their caves. So basically, you know, the, the man will go into his cave and continue to maybe be unhappy or whatever, but anyway, he's into himself. And and uh, so the, the woman is, again, she's not in that cave. She's in a different place. <laughs> yeah. and, and there can be some... Um, tactical advantages to being the petitioner mm -hmm. and and sometimes when people are aware of that uh, there's a race to the courthouse to see who can file and serve so it's whoever files and serves first uh, wins out that race if they each file separate petitions mm -hmm. and the petitioner can have a tactical advantage because if the case does go to trial and not many do but of the few that do I, I think being able to put your case on first as the petitioner can give you an advantage. You can th do things such as call the adverse party as your first witness and start cross-examining them before they get to do anything with their case. And, mm. and I think that can be very advantageous if you go to trial. And again, that's fairly rare that people actually go to trial. Okay. So now, is there a difference like for people who are uh, very affluent, for example, uh, and how they approach this, uh, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurial type people, people who have family businesses, or now they got assets, now things are really on the line. I, well, I think that um, entrepreneurial people, people with family businesses, uh, first, it's more likely they're going to have complications in their divorce because of the, the nature of the asset. It's more difficult to divide mm -hmm. and more likely that there'll be disputes. Um, but as a consequence, I think people sometimes are more cautious about entering into a divorce if they have a family business because uh, particularly if both parties are dependent on it, both parties might mm -hmm. be employed in the family business and it can really cause problems. Mm -hmm. A lot of family businesses, there are other family members working there, maybe your right. children uh, or uh, parents, grandparents. And uh, you know that uh, that can really tear a business apart when the the owners or primary owners go through a divorce. Okay. Well, we'll get into that more in another session. But uh, anyway, I just thought I would bring up the issue as far as maybe a little bit of the psychology getting into this. All right. Well, what are some of the most difficult areas uh, that you deal with uh, when you're getting into this divorce process? Uh, from the lawyer standpoint or the client standpoint? Well, maybe both. I maybe don't... both. Uh, well, I, one of the areas that uh, I, th I think we've seen more and more litigation is in the area of domestic violence. Mm. When I first started practicing 33 years ago, the law was really quite different in terms of how we dealt with the issue of domestic violence. There's been a lot of legislation over the years that have changed the rules 
Um, and as a consequence, uh, we see a lot more litigation. Um, victims of domestic violence have rights uh, that they would not have had, uh, say, decades ago. Uh -huh. um, and those rights might give them an advantage in a child custody dispute. And conversely, someone accused of domestic violence might be at a, a disadvantage uh, if they are determined to be a perpetrator of domestic violence. It can also affect uh, spousal support rights and consideration. So mm -hmm. I see that uh, more and more of these decisions are made on whether to seek domestic violence restraining orders. A consequence of that is often uh, because the um, negative effects of being uh, found to be a perpetrator of domestic violence and subject to restraining orders is so serious that there is a much uh, greater likelihood people will fight those allegations, which can mean uh, numerous court appearances and a lot of legal fees and expenses. Uh, so those are tough decisions to make, especially in close calls. You know, there is a um, there are extremes when it comes to domestic violence, from you know very serious uh, uh, you know, attempted murder or actual murders, as we've seen here in our community. Uh, over recent years to um, allegations of domestic violence that are much less serious and sometimes there's judgment calls uh, on whether you're going to pursue them and even the victim may consider the consequences to the family. What if uh, as a result of a domestic violence allegation your spouse loses their job and, and cannot find replacement income uh, perhaps ever at the level where they are working. So those can be uh, difficult decisions. Um, child custody decisions. Um, what are you going to seek? A lot of people, of course, are very emotional at the time of separation and may ask for child custody orders that had they cooled off and thought about them uh, months or a year or so later, they might have made a different decision. Um, so I guess both clients and lawyers have to think these things through, uh, as well as look at long-term consequences, because sometimes what you ask for up front may affect the long-term outcome. For example, child custody. Uh, there's always a concern that after a divorce, one spouse may, may want to move out of the area with the children. Uh, and so the, whatever those initial orders are may in, either inhibit the other spouse from moving away or may give you a greater likelihood of success of trying to move away with children at a later date. Wow. Okay. How about the area of disclosures? Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Sure. This has been a real big area. When I first started practicing in the area of family law, it was just like civil litigation. We used almost all formal discovery just like you would in business litigation or a personal injury suit, uh, depositions, requests, formal requests for documents, written interrogatories. We still use those uh, mechanisms, mm -hmm. but the law tells us now that each spouse has a fiduciary duty toward each other, which includes mandatory, mandatory disclosure obligations. Uh, and the law says each spouse is obligated to make a complete and full disclosure of all material facts and information concerning the existence and value of property as well as the existence of income. And this can be a big job in some cases. Uh, I find that um, clients often take it lightly and they think, well, we're going to have an agreement, so what's the big deal, or my spouse knows everything. Uh, and sometimes they assume their spouse knows mm -hmm. something that the other spouse is claiming they don't know about. Mm -hmm. The consequences of not making full disclosure can be extreme. It could lead to a later request to set aside a judgment and start the divorce all over again effectively. <laughs> not fun and no. expensive. Yes, very uh, expensive. There can be um, financial sanctions for failure to make full disclosures. Uh, so it, it's a very serious business. The law. Um, uh, tries to make it very clear, but it's, it's surprising to me that even when you have two good lawyers um, telling their clients these things, sometimes we find out people have not made disclosures of things they should have disclosed. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to do a whole program related to family residence, but since we are talking about some basics, maybe you could just throw out a couple of highlights before we move on as far as maybe things to think about. Yeah. Well, the family residence, I would say in a high percentage of cases, is the biggest asset of the marriage. 
and so it's it's very important um, and the, it often is the focus of a lot of decisions particularly if their children a custodial parent uh, or even a joint custodial parent may want to hang on to the residence so they keep children in the same school district um, so it's it's often something that that takes a lot of time and consideration uh, if it's community property the way the law looks at it, it's just a question of what's the value and if somebody wants to keep it are they going to be able to pay their spouse for their one-half community interest in it um, but it can become more complicated because uh, very often uh, there are characterization issues meaning disputes about whether the home is community property versus separate property or perhaps a mixture or very commonly we have uh, what we call reimbursement claims related to the residents uh, there's a, a family code section, uh, section 2640, tells us that if a spouse contributes their separate property to the acquisition of the family residence, they're entitled to reimbursement. So we're often looking carefully, sometimes the very old records, residences that may have been bought many years ago, to determine whether someone can show that they contributed their separate property either to the down payment or uh, to principal pay down on a mortgage or improvements to a house. Um, these are areas of dispute and what I'm seeing now in this uh, era, era of people relying on their computers and electronic uh, uh, control of um, financial data as opposed to keeping paper like people used to, I'm finding more and more people are not able to come up with the information so they can prove their separate property reimbursement claims. Okay, I think we have to cut it off there. We're going to do a whole program on residents, folks, so uh, tune in uh, for our next couple of episodes. All right, are there any differences in how community property is treated for divorce from how it's treated for death? Well, certainly one of them is this code section I mentioned, Family Code Section 2640. Uh, applies in dissolution of marriage but not on death uh, and again that's um, that is a, a reimbursement claim doesn't only apply to family residences it just turns out that's probably the most common mm -hmm. uh, because it's one of the few assets at least until recently that always appreciates uh -huh. <laughs> we've certainly seen that that isn't the case the last uh, few years mm -hmm. but you could have a 2640 reimbursement claim um, in an automobile um, or other assets and mm -hmm. um, but only applies on dissolution of marriage. Okay. Um, how is mediation used as an alternative to a court proceeding? Okay. Well, first, um, there's mandatory mediation in California in child custody disputes. So anybody who has children that is unable to reach an agreement on their own on child custody and visitation orders is referred to mediation. That could either be mediation through family court services, which is an arm of the court where they have uh, mental health professionals that actually work in the court system that provide mediation services, or you can opt out and hire a private mediator, uh, usually a licensed social worker or um, a psychologist, or somebody that practices uh, in the child custody area in the mental health field. Uh, so that's one area where it's mandatory. Now, other than that, it is discretionary. Um, so some people will attempt to mediate their disputes without going through uh, directly through the court system and actually going to court. Although I often say that a case that could be mediated probably could be settled without going to court um, anyway. Uh, and a mediator, of course, is a, a neutral facilitator trying to help people and guide them toward an agreement. There uh, uh, are quite a few good attorneys out there that practice mediation exclusively now, including certified family law specialists. Uh, I think people that are ready for mediation, uh, it's a good thing. Often right at the beginning of the case, I think a lot of people just aren't ready. It takes some period of separation for people to be more focused on treating the divorce more like a business transaction and taking some of the emotion out of it. Um, so I find that people that have been separated for a longer period of time perhaps are better candidates for mediation. Uh, people that um, 
are of similar abilities coming into mediation. Sometimes one spouse is much more informed than the other. For example, if there's a family business, that spouse mm -hmm. may have superior knowledge and the non-business owning spouse may not be as good of a candidate for mediation because they may not be as prepared and able to look out for their interests going into a, a mediation. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some of the, the problems or, that can arise later when people use the mediation process? Well, as uh, an attorney, I often see uh, failed mediations. Yeah. So some people will come in who've tried it, and they it, it just hasn't worked for them. Mm -hmm. And I suppose there isn't a lot lost other than maybe some time and money if they've tried mediation and they're not successful in reaching an agreement. Um, I've, I've seen some cases over the years where people hired unqualified mediators, something other than an experienced attorney. There are people out there uh, maybe calling themselves something other than attorneys, um, but uh, maybe essentially practicing law and facilitating agreements that they aren't qualified to, to help people with and mistakes are made, um, maybe uh, mistakes that could lead to uh, unintended adverse tax consequences, uh, agreements where people overlooked an important right, maybe they gave up an asset that was actually their separate property, but they treated it as community property because they weren't getting legal advice uh, and um, they really entered into the process unprepared. Some of these mediation agreements, if, if there are problems with them, lead to litigation and efforts to set the agreement aside and either set it up uh, aside in part or in whole and essentially start over again in the litigation process. Um, and I have no statistics. I, I expect mm -hmm. that most mediation agreements are, are reasonable and fair and they hold up and that's it. Um, but doing what I do, I see the ones that <laughs> haven't worked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if somebody does want to set aside, are there any sort of time frames or things of things that they need to do? People should be aware of that. So if they, whether it's mediation or a, a negotiated agreement, if they determine later that there's something wrong with it, there are some statutes of limitation. So you need to be aware of that and you don't want to sleep on your rights. Um, some are wide open. For example, uh, there's a code section that says assets that are not identified, divided, and awarded in a judgment the court has continuing jurisdiction forever to divide those assets. So if uh, you just forgot or you didn't know about some contingent asset, it sh shows up later, uh, the court has authority to divide it later at the request of either party. Um, but if it's a case of fraud where you've been induced into an agreement and someone uh, didn't disclose something they should have disclosed, there are some limitations on how long you have to bring that issue back to court and ask the court to set aside uh, the agreement in whole or in part. So you definitely want to uh, be diligent and, and look into your rights promptly if you think you have a problem. Okay. Um, what if the previous judgment was based on a mistake of fact or law? Well, that's a, that's a funny thing. And the uh, statute says that the court has authority to set aside a judgment based upon mistake, either a mistake of fact or a mistake of law, and it could be either a unilateral mistake or a mutual mistake. So it's almost, it sounds like a get out of jail free card. Yeah. You would have to show that you'd materially benefit. You can't just go back and say, hey, I just want to keep redoing my divorce again and again. So, so you have to show that there was a, an actual mistake and that redoing the judgment in whole or in part would materially benefit the party that was requesting it. Now, we've been talking a little bit about negotiated settlement. So what's the difference between it? And we've got about three minutes. Negotiated settlement as compared to like a mediation or, or are they the same sort of thing? Or? It should be the same thing. The final document should look identical, whether it's a negotiated settlement be to, between a husband and wife working directly with each other or uh, using their attorneys to assist them in the process or whether they go to mediation or use collaborative law or for that matter go to court and have uh, a trial and let the judge make a decision, the end result is going to be 
a piece of paper that tells you what your respective rights and responsibilities are. It should divide your property and uh, determine support rights, attorney fee obligations, and who's going to pay the debts. Would you say that most of the uh, divorce agreements that, that you deal with, are they like this, is, is it a negotiation almost like attorney to attorney with the clients? Or is it uh, you know mediation or, or how does it usually work? Uh, most of mine would be negotiated uh, between the parties and attorneys. We often have four-way meetings where all four of us will sit around a table in a conference room just like the, they do in the TV shows and movies. Okay. Uh, often though, by the time you get to that point, there's been a lot of information exchanged. Uh, perhaps there have been proposals back and forth in letter form. You may have had some informal settlement meetings at court. Um, but uh, I, I would say a high, high proportion of cases are settled. Um, through negotiated settlements uh, drafted by the attorneys, approved by the parties with their direct participation. Okay. Well, we don't have much time, maybe about 30 seconds. Would you like to maybe throw out a final thought or something related to some basics for divorce? I, I guess I would certainly try and get information from a qualified attorney early on, even if you think you know what you're doing. Uh, I've seen some very intelligent people make some very bad mistakes they were sorry about uh, because they didn't get information they should have had. doesn't mean you have to hire the lawyer or even hire a lawyer, but um, you ought to at least consult one and uh, get some background information and get some assurance that you at least understand what your issues are and what the options are. That's great. Mark, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Folks, I hope that uh, you found this kind of enlightening, at least thought-provoking. And uh, if you are thinking of getting a divorce, uh, I don't think it's a do-it-yourself project in most cases, especially if you have much property and so forth and children. So uh, definitely do find to seek a, a good legal counsel. And we'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly.